Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, welcome. Uh, I'm James Jones from MPIC, and does anybody here know Michael McKeever? This is this is Michael McKeever. <laughs> Michael just called about an hour or two ago. He's uh, he's sick and can't make it. But this is Rick Graziani from Cabrillo College. He's got similar experience. Uh, to Michael, and he's graciously agreed to jump in and participate in, uh, in this session with me. Michael's flying to Paris on uh, Sunday. We've got an exchange going between Paris and San Francisco, and Michael's putting that together. It's a capstone course uh, that's a scenario-based learning thing. It's got students in Paris working with students from five colleges here, and. Uh, some of the students are actually going to go over to Paris in the, in the spring. I would have gone to Paris for him. <laughs> you don't have a choice. <laughs> he didn't, poor Michael didn't get a chance for that. So if we can uh, just take a moment. I want to uh, create this experience for everybody. So you've got a computer in front of you. If you'll follow along with these simple instructions by going to impic.org. And this is the way people are joining this uh, conference remotely. Uh, there are some people who can't physically be here today, but they're sitting in on some of the sessions. Uh, there's a remote attendance uh, link over here in the currently featuring section. If you'll just click on that. And then <coughs> there's Thursday at 4.30. That's this slot right down here. And if you click on that, you'll advance to this session, which is room 516, Approving Student and Educator Outcomes with Online Collaboration Tools. Just click on the Connect button. And then I believe it will prompt you for your name only. So we'll take a moment for everybody to do that. That way you get a little experience with this, uh, with this platform as we go along. How are we doing? Uh, I'm and that's going to launch to eliminate five sections, which is Java, Bane, and I give you a long time. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I Alright, uh, Whatever it defaults to, you're actually a way the way it'll work. The beauty of this platform is it'll work from any computer on any operating system, any network connection speed, anywhere in the world. So anybody can connect to you. Uh, can hack in the group and then right, there you go. <laughs> How are you doing? Whatever you want to call yourself. Most kind of. All I see. No, I don't see. We should turn off the microphone. Oh, there we go. I would show up the microphone. We should show up the microphone. Our voices, we don't want to. So it's not. I don't know. I have to set up our microphone. Okay. Anybody having trouble? Okay. So uh, I'm going to jump ahead here. So uh, reduce the audio speaker level to zero. You'll see a little audio sec uh, section down here on the bottom left. We want to reduce those levels so we're not hearing my voice uh, coming out of your speakers and creating echo effects in the room. 
Everybody see that? So I'm not hearing my voice from any speakers, so that probably means we're okay. Uh, so uh, how many are from California here? Okay, you're in luck because this CCC Confer program is provided free to everybody in California at a community college. Uh, it's an extraordinary resource. It's absolutely mind-blowingly wonderful. But if you're not from California, you're not out of luck because these platforms exist uh, and you can get access to them and use them uh, as well. Uh, CCC Confer uses currently Illuminate. Illuminate is in the process of merging with WIMDA. WIMDA also has a, a platform like this. There's uh, Cisco WebEx, Adobe Connect. All of these are similar online collaboration tools and environments. Um, but we're going to show you CCC Confer because a lot of you are from California and it's free and it's absolutely amazing. Um, and we'll spend just a moment uh, exploring the platform. Um, and <coughs> maybe what I want to do here is see it. Um, I'll show the default layout here and you can see some different uh, functionality that exists within the program. Across the top it's, uh, it's menu driven. So you've got a uh, file where you can open sessions and so forth, leave sessions. View gives you different ways to see your screen. But the tools are, are really powerful. You can share your computer desktop. You can share any application. Uh, you can create breakout rooms for students to work in groups together and other uh, people can't see what they're doing. You can come through and monitor it, see it over time. You can give people elsewhere moderator privileges so that they can control this application and present things to others. There's uh, polling capabilities that are built in here. Uh, people can chat down here in this section. You can say, uh, you know, homework due Wednesday. And that's going to come out to everybody. Uh, people can chat with each other independently. Grace, uh, would you like to talk about any of the capabilities of this platform? Grace is our uh, MPIC uh, administrative expert and uh, CCC conferred guru. Um, but you've got uh, you've got here an ability to to raise your hand and say, hey, I want some attention. There's some emoticons down here where you can express, you know, that, that you like something or that you are confused by it. You can dislike something. You can, uh, you know, express a whole bunch of different opinions. As a moderator, you can get rid of those if you don't want them. Um, you can give people remotely microphone privileges. Uh, a part of this capability is audio conferencing bridges, which you can get for free. You know, your traditional conference uh, calling services. You can connect a phone conference bridge with a web session. Uh, you can record everything. Um, there's timers. There's uh, tools that go along with it. Um, here's an example that's kind of cool. You can start a web tour. <coughs> where you send somebody out to a website so they see it on, on their screen. This is the CCC Confer uh, interface. CCC Confer is uh, 
funded by a grant from the California Community College Chancellor's Office. Uh, so you provide the Illuminate platform uh, for free through a perpetual license. They also provide some value-added services, uh, conferencing, scheduling services, and archiving. You can record anything you do, and it's available, and they, they, they host that for you. So you can go back and find your sessions later. For how long? Forever, as far as I know. Uh, there's, uh, for ADA compliance purposes, there's real-time transcription services. So you can schedule the, I, I, I need to have uh, transcription services because I've got a person who's hard of hearing who's in my class. And there will be a real person who joins your session remotely and types up every word that's said. That creates a transcript of the class uh, forever. Um, so really, really powerful uh, ideas. One of the things that, that they encourage is uh, remote online office hours for faculty. So once a week from 3 to 5, I have online office hours. So that student who works and wouldn't be able to come in otherwise you can actually connect with them online. You can log into laboratory equipment together and solve problems. I think that's something to take up with your chair, but uh, in my mind, that's perfectly allowable. If you can say, here's my office hour, you can come in remotely or you can come in in person. Yeah, it's more convenient for the students because you're doing multiple ones at the same time. So uh, I don't want to overwhelm anyone with the, with the capabilities of the platform, but just say that they're, they're really, really rich and robust and uh, it's, it's powerful. Uh, you can integrate. Uh, you know, remote access to real laboratory equipment in this as a shared application. Uh, come in through NetLab, get into your Cisco equipment, configure routers. You as a teacher can watch the students doing that. Uh, if they're making mistakes, you can come in and help them remotely online. So compared to a traditional sort of asynchronous delivery of a class um, where it's not interactive, uh, this is really, really powerful and effective because you can follow along. You can get feedback. Did you get it, what I just said? And you get an answer to that. Uh, are you stuck? Well, let me say it in another way. So it's, it's interactive and it's synchronous and you can give uh, students ways of, of collaborating. So rather than have uh, me talk anymore, I thought maybe we let Rick from Cabrillo talk about it because he's been using this platform to teach for a couple of semesters. I don't know, I'm not going to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've been using CCC Confer for about uh, a year and a half. Uh, I teach I started using it because uh, I teach uh, the CCMP classes. And a lot of times it's really hard for us to get high enough enrollments for those courses just in-person students. So what we did and what we did was we decided to offer this class also online. We do what's called an overlay section. So the good news is is that using students both in person, online live, and also students that register but they can't attend live online, they can view the archive. We get I have three different groups of students. So the good news is the class is really still up. The bad news is, at least from at Cabrillo, I get paid for one class. But, you know, it's, it's okay. Uh, so the way that I, I, I teach the class is uh, the students sign up for the one class, either, either online or in person. But the way I do it, at least for my CCMP classes, is students can either attend in person, no matter what they sign up for. They can attend in person, online live, or uh, just view the archive on their own time, or any combination of it. And that's really great 
for students that are well disciplined, want to be in the class, want to know the material, because they're going to make sure that, you know, that, that they're either in person or online. And it's also nice that a student is sick or they miss some material or not sure they can go back and they can review the archive, etc. The downside to that is, you know, the first couple of weeks I have a lot of students in person. Then they see all those online. They go, hey, you know, I could be at home in my pajamas reading email while listening to Rick and eating dinner. I don't have to be here. And so then you start to see those migrate to here. And then those that are online going, oh, I'm at home online in my pajamas. You know, I could be, you know, over at Margaritaville having a margarita instead of listening to Rick. I'll go listen to Rick later. We call it the slippery slope. Because what happens then the next thing is they're on they're viewing the archive and they'll go, well, I'll get to it later, I'll get to it later, and they end up dropping. So you really gotta kind of keep up, keep on top of that with the students. Um, and how I present is really different when I use CCC Confer. Uh, before I get to that real quick, the chat area, I always warn students, you know, they can if they can chat to everybody. Or they can do a private chat, you know, like James can just, you know, chat chat with Rich or something and say, you know, Rick really is a horrible instructor as a private chat. Well, it shows up on the moderator. <laughs> um, but the way I teach the class is really different. Because when when you're you know, when you're standing in front of a group of people. And this is something that I think is really important because it took me a while to figure this out. But when you stand in front of a group of people, they see you move now. You can use the whiteboard over here. We can do group work. We can talk. But it's different when you have students also online and on the archive. For me, I've had to be a lot more scripted in how I'm going to do my presentations with, you know, my 120 slide PowerPoint presentations, along with, you know, uh, demonstrating in NetLab or whatever, but really being scripted and well prepared because it's, it's like listening to the radio when something goes wrong and you have dead air. It's okay for the people here, they see that something's wrong or whatever, but the people that are online or listening to the archive, it's really easy for them to tune out. And a lot of them that's happening a lot. So you really got to kind of keep it scripted, uh, uh, keep it moving, try not to have a lot of pauses. If there are pauses or like a student has a question, you can either have a microphone you can pass around or what I do is students will raise their hand in class. Now when they're asking a question, the person online doesn't know that. They just hear dead air. So what I do is say, uh, uh, I'm going to pause a second. Somebody has a question. So they know that somebody's asking a question, then I'll repeat the question. So it's a lot of little things like that that you have to continuously do. Um, the other thing I'm always doing is checking in with my online students. Like, are you getting this? Are you, you know, having them use the happy face, whatever? There's, you know, uh, what level are we at? I'll have like little questions throughout my PowerPoint. So I'm constantly having people interact. And what I also have to do is have my students that are in the classroom, they sign on to CCC Cooper. So they can so they're so they feel like one big classroom. And that really helps a lot. So you really kind of gotta change, at least I did, you know, how I do things. I also have two computers that I use. I use one to do the actual presentation. And what I tend to use is, you know, use the whole screen so I can't see this and the students don't see this. Okay, so I, you know, full screen because you've, you've got a lot of things going and all that and don't want all of this on there. But I will have another computer that I log in as moderator. And there I'm keeping an eye out for the chat. And also other students will too will go, hey, uh, Rick, uh, you know, Sue has a question. Yeah. So if they're all logged in to CCC Confer, so I drop a quiz question and have an answer to those who answer to that right? Yes. Yes. And it's a totally replace the iPhone. Uh, in a way, yeah. 
And there's some other things that that allows you to do, like if you want to show a little video from or the web or something, it's that, it, you can use the web tour. So what that does is it sends everybody to the site and then streams it from there. So you can do, you can, there's a lot of little tricks and things like that that you can do. Um, so they can't interact then with the web page that pops up here. I can't interact with it. There, if you do the web tour, they can interact with it. They can? Yes. But you can also click on what you click on, they're going to see, but then they can also interact with it. So if you choose, there's a follow the web tour. Yeah. So if you go up to uh, follow the moderator, there's a uh, follow the moderator. So here's a start a web tour. You put in a URL, like maybe YouTube or something like that, and it will push it out to everybody. And you also have, you know, uh, to manipulate it however you want. I'm going to get one point you know, that's a good question. It kind of depends on the class. You know, the question is how many students do you have to manage? It, um, can you manage with something like this? Um, this I've had as many as 55, 60. Uh, but what tends to happen is you get maybe 40. You know, I've got 30 in class, another 20 that are online, and then maybe another 20 that view the archive. It's on it's one of my typical classes. Um, but it's, uh, so it is, you know, as far as an instructor, I mean, it does allow, open up the door for a lot more students. I have students that are, that uh, I have one student that's from Australia, that's Australia that's been taking one of my classes. So, yeah. So is it a, a way to create an elastic size of classroom? I mean, the administrators love this because they don't have to really pay to have an instructor and open another class? Yes. Well, my, my school loved it when we were getting paid for enrollments from the state. Uh, now that our enrollment, now that you know, budgets are such that you know, we're trying to keep our enrollments down and not, you know, but it does, it really does help bring in enrollments. Uh, it also in for kind of more professional courses, those students that normally, you know, they don't want. I, I know what it's like where you live, but in Santa Cruz, where I'm from, you know, rush hour, getting across town. You know, to, to get to a night class can take an hour. And this has really helped students that normally wouldn't take classes or be able to get to a class, take a class, or somebody that's working. Or I have students that can't take my class because they're in another class at the same time. So it's really opened a lot of doors for students. Um, and uh, the students that are. It takes a special student to be able to do it online, though. And I've warned students about that. They have to be disciplined, and they have to show, you know, I, I hate that commercial of the, I don't think you've seen it where you live, but the online learning, the, the, the young woman's in pajamas. Yeah. It's like, oh, I go to school in my pajamas. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, exactly in our place, are worried about, well, once I record all this and it can be archived, they don't need me. Or they'll make me do something else and what about the intellectual property that goes into developing this? Well, first, yeah, first of all, I claim no intellectual property because I think you have to have some sort of intellect. <laughs> <laughs> but also, seriously, I didn't know I teach networking. I didn't invent any of these protocols. You know, and it, so, you know, I... Oh, your labs and my labs, the activities that you have them. You on. know, I, I've done some of these presentations where I just sat in a room and recorded it of myself, thinking I could just you, create a plant, key teaching presentation, and allow, and reuse it every year. And, I, and I've never liked it. Because, have you ever, like, watched one of those video classes you know, and that's how it sounds, Kim. When you're in front of a live class, it really changes how, at least for me, how I present. And the students feel like they're part of a real class. Now, how is that if it's recorded? Could I use it every year? I change my stuff every year. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't think students would get 
nearly the benefit as attending a real class that is constantly changing and dynamic and, and has the option of doing it live. So how long do you keep your archives? They're up there forever, but uh, and CCC confirmed it keeps them forever. But uh, I, I allow my students to have access to it until I, I teach it again. The end semester, they don't really need it anymore? <laughs> you know, I, I would have thought that students would always go back and you know, listen to it. You know, who who it? You know, I said, yeah, you're going to want to listen to you know OSPF, aren't you? You know, every they, they don't. You know, uh, you know. So I I think there will be some of that, but I haven't seen much of it. So uh, I just want to talk a little bit about what what some people are are, are doing with this platform. So. It, it gives, like Rick was talking about, an opportunity for someone to attend a class in person. If they can make it, great. Come on in. We'll teach a class just like we have all, always. But at the same time, if you can't make it, you can also participate interactively through the Internet. And it's all happening at, at the same time. Uh, you can also participate in real time on the phone. If you can't do either one, you can be sitting in your car listening to your cell phone and you can hear what's going on in class. Uh, you can view archive classes at any time via the Internet. Uh, one of the things we've noticed is that changes, for example, student note-taking behavior. So if you no longer have to furiously scribble down every word that you hear from the professor because you know you can go back and hear that later, uh, people take notes in a different way. Here's an idea I had while I was listening to this. Or here's something I want to come back and, and listen to in more depth. I want to hear this again later. Um, so it's possible to get uh, transcriptions created in real time for ADA compliance. Uh, you can download classes to computers or mobile devices because there's a conversion utility that goes with this, uh, Publish. So you can uh, take your, your class lecture or experience, uh, convert it to a quick time movie, and people can listen to it on the bar train as they're coming into class the next day. Or have it available on their computers to listen to anywhere, out on the beach or whatever. Um, you can work on uh, lab exercises in person, but you can also build in remote access to those labs. And you can empower students to work together in groups on labs from anywhere, which is really powerful. You can come in and help them out if they get stuck. Uh, so there's a lot of real uh, powerful capabilities in this. Again, the, the online office hours uh, where people can come in from their workplace or whatever and, and uh, talk to the teacher and get questions answered, but more importantly, get unstuck. You know, find that place where I, I don't get it. You know and they get unstuck and then they can move forward. Um, this helps with student recruitment. <coughs> so imagine, I'm, I'm, I got a job. You're offering a class, it's got 10 sessions. I know I'm going to miss three of them because I got that business trip. Now instead of saying I, I'm not going to take the class this semester, I say well, I'm going to take those three sessions remotely or I'm going to uh, view the archives later on. Michael McKeever's had students come in from Australia, India, China, uh, who are out doing business travel and they just sit in on the class from, from those remote locations. It helps a lot with student retention because the student doesn't have to drop the class because they missed a couple of sessions or because they found out about a business trip uh, after they already got started with the class. Uh, it helps with retention because you can easier get students unstuck uh, because you can get into that uh, Cisco router together with them from home and you can, you can get them over that hump of, of whatever it was that was causing the problems. That helps with uh, completion. More students finish the class. Um, a lot of students uh, talk about better performance because of the versatile delivery method. You've got different student situations and learning styles. They're more likely to find something if you're delivering it in three methods simultaneously that's going to work for them. Um, you know, sometimes I need to be there in person. Sometimes I want to interact via the internet. Sometimes I just want to see the archive. 
between those three options, there's more chance that I'm going to be successful in the class. A lot of great <laughs> student relationship stories, you know, students who connect with each other through this online tool and uh, you know, are, are able to help each other out. Just, you know, people learn from each other also. Um, we've seen a lot of people use this platform for remote guest lectures. So we're going to talk about uh, something today. I know a guy who's, who's working over at Cisco with this very thing. And he's not going to drive an hour and 15 minutes in rush hour to come sit in my class. But if I can have him just come in from his desktop at work for free, that really makes my classroom experience a lot richer. And some people don't do anything more than that, just as a one-off. You know, this one time, you know, we're going we're gonna to bring this guy in remotely and uh, have him talk to the class. And here's what it's like when you work in, in my job you know, or my place or, or here's this problem that we encountered in the real world and here's how we solved it. Uh, you can do remote site visits. There's video that's built into this. You can have up to six streams of video coming into this. So you can show people things in the real world that they may not see otherwise. Uh, it's easy to build in uh, recordings of other students in the past. You know, here's what this experience was like last year. The Indiana Commission on Higher Education is changing how we get funded, like what you were saying. Only in our case, they're saying, not only do we want to see your students complete and get their degree, we want to see them complete that course. So do you guys have any uh, research or statistics on improve student completion, we could probably use some of that information to support maybe getting additional TAs to help with that second monitor so the instructor that's doing the actual lecturing doesn't feel so isolated. One of my faculty, we did the same thing you did where we had um, a traditional class but we opened it up for outside people and he told me because of the programming class it was hard for him to be able to demonstrate or do certain things because the students that were not right there, it was difficult to interact with their questions. But if we had funding that would allow someone else to come in there and, and help interpret or guide those questions, that would be better. Yeah, so th to answer that question, we have done some pilots. There has been evaluation associated with those pilots, but I wouldn't call them statistically significant enough to convince uh, you know, an administrator to spend a whole lot of money. Um, so you know, we're moving in that direction and I'll describe a little bit how this uh, effort is building momentum around here um, in a minute. So uh, you know, we got excited when we bumped into this platform and, and figured, hey, there's a whole lot of stuff we can do with this to improve ICT education. It's just probably like you're having thoughts in your mind right now, here's what I can do with this. We had thoughts like that. And one of the things we noticed was uh, many of the ICT-related programs <laughs> at community college uh, offer lower-level classes that you can fill consistently. It's bread and butter. You know, you, I know if I offer this class, it's going to fill every single time. Uh, and it's a great class. There's demand for it. They're serving a need. Nothing wrong with that at all. But there's also need out there for more advanced and specialized classes. And a lot of us don't get around to them because you just can't quite justify it. We serve the center of the bell curve, but these tails are, are largely unserved. So, but, but we as a society do need these advanced uh, skill sets. How can we work together to, uh, to make that happen? Well, you know, the decisions not to offer those advanced courses are rational. A lot of times it takes a big investment in equipment or you've got to, you know, bring that faculty member up to speed so they can teach the class. Uh, there's not enough people all the time to fill those seats locally. But there is enough demand in the wider region. So if, if I were to offer from my school this specialized class and you're serving students from many different schools and you're offering a different specialized class from your school and my students are served that way, 
isn't that a win-win, win-win-win-win-win-win-win if we can replicate it? So that's one of the ideas that we like a lot. And how do you collect the revenue? Well, that's an interesting idea. Our question. Uh, there is a, I'm not sure if I have it in here. Here's one model. MarylandOnline.org has what they call a seat sharing or a seat bank model where uh, MarylandOnline.org uh, serves as a clearinghouse for that. And people offer up courses in this manner and then they exchange money. We've had conversations about doing something like that in California and there's just huge obstacles to it. Um, so in the meantime, we, we haven't been doing that. We've just been encouraging people to uh, offer these classes up and uh, let's, let's prove the merits of them before we try to get you know, a coordinated system in place. It's just too daunting. Um, so anyway, here was that concept of you know, leveraging equipment investments. So for example, City College of San Francisco is a, is a Juniper Academy. Juniper gave uh, City College $100,000 worth of lab gear. You can't fill that class every semester, but there's plenty of demand for Juniper training from, from the region. Why not let City College be the Juniper place and uh, deliver that stuff everywhere and you, know, you, you deliver the Adobe or something else. That was that idea. So we did a fall back in 2009. We taught Juniper from here. Rick taught CCMP. Uh, Internet Works. Uh, Mike Murphy at Foothill College taught uh, EMC's first uh, storage class. Uh, we used this sort of multimodal delivery and uh, had some great stories back from students. You know, 80% said that was a major factor in affecting their decision to enroll and ability to complete. Uh, so, you know, there's a little bit of data here, but I wouldn't call it enough to, to convince an administrator to really make big changes. Um, this is a, a synergy project for us. We've got some uh, support from the National Science Foundation to try to encourage this. Uh, there's a long-winded way of saying, if we could make this work, uh, where we're offering up classes in this manner and serving the tails more effectively, we would improve ICT education. We'd have more people with these skills out there. Uh, we'd have better uh, relationships with business and industry because they'd be more likely to give me gear if they knew that I could fill my class every semester than they will if they know I, I can just offer it every other semester or so because that's all the demand there is locally. Um, and there's a bunch of thought and rationale behind why we think that this is a good idea and should be effective. But in the meantime, uh, we're just trying to expose people to the platform. Say, hey, this is cool. Doug, we should be taking advantage of it. It's free. And you don't have to offer the class in this free mode way. Just play with it. Have conference calls for your uh, department meetings. It's free. You know, uh, allow people to come in remotely, have guest lectures, do online office hours. Uh, you know, it, at last year's winter conference and at this one, we're making all these sessions available remotely. And not everybody can come to this event. This is a way of expanding the impact of this event to all kinds of people in real time, but also to all kinds of people in not real time, because you can come back and do the archives. You can share those. Now, I, I'll provide you the service of, I went to the conference and there were 10 sessions I attended, three of them were awesome. Check out these three and you can do that without wasting your time or travel money or whatever. Um, we've been uh, offering faculty development training in this platform for three years in a row. We've got a couple of dozen uh, teachers in the area who are really good with this platform now and who have started delivering classes in this manner. Uh, last fall we had six going. Uh, Rick did a couple from Cabrillo, uh, Michael from Santa Rosa. Uh, this spring we got a lot more going on and these are through 
our website right now. Uh, ultimately, that's not really the way to scale it, but you can see what begins to happen as you get more and more of these classes in here. You know, I want to take uh, a Juno's class. It's the first time this class is being offered in the world. As it's a partnership with, with Juniper. And you can take it from anywhere. Uh, that's cool. Uh, I want to do Adobe. Maybe my school doesn't have anything going with Adobe. Here's a way I can get, get my student who's super interested in that to take an Adobe class. Are the fees that students take on uh, using this tool more or less the same than if they're on campus? Right now, uh, we're just encouraging people to take the class. And so they, they're going to have to enroll in that local college the way they would any online class. So there's, they may have to pay a student service fee at their home campus and also at the remote campus. We don't have any way around that. But as this thing starts to build uh, momentum, <laughs> we hope that we'll have you know, enough support for arguments that we should be able to waive that. Why should I pay a student service fee at that campus? I'm never even going to go there. <laughs> I live, you know, somewhere far away. Um, so anyway, this is this is building momentum, and I, I see Vicky over here from the California Virtual Campus. So we've been collaborating uh, to try to come up with a way to to make these classes available that is more scalable and sustainable and Intip just trying to put something together on its own. And the California Virtual Campus, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's sort of a clearinghouse for online courses uh, and it's being reinvented, I guess we could say. Uh, and there's been a lot of thought to make this uh, more useful and effective to people. It's going to relaunch in the spring. We've got a little profile that's going to be a part of that that refers people to this. And what we hope over time is that we can come up with a new way of describing these course opportunities that's not just a traditional online class or traditional TV class or traditional video based delivery, but here's a synchronous interactive course. So that, that people have those kinds of uh, choices, and that this can be a place where these kinds of classes reside, and in the, in the process over time, uh, we'll have a richer set of ICT course offerings uh, in the region. I just want to also mention too, uh, using this tool, you don't have to use it just for an online class. We have teachers, I use it in other classes where I have just recorded how to, de to demonstrate stuff, like how to use packet tracing. And so I recorded one of the camp presentations in my office, and that is something that I can review. And, uh, and also some students can always go back to it. So you don't have to use this tool just if you're teaching on the students. Yeah, and we don't want anybody to get intimidated by the power of this tool and, and the idea that you've got to somehow deliver classes to everybody in the universe and all this stuff that's intimidating. You know, that, I would hope that the takeaway from this is just, wow, here's a really powerful cool tool that I can use for a variety of things. Try it. Do something with it. Do anything with it. Um, and then over time, as you become more comfortable with it, uh, you can use this tool for, for more and more things. Uh, if you are interested in, in playing with this or learning a little bit more about it, there's a toolkit up on our website which uh, helps guide you through the use of this platform, makes it a little bit less intimidating, we hope. We've done a few articles on it. Uh, the courses that are available now are up there. If any of you uh, want to learn how to do this, let us know. We can help you with that. If any of you will do this and would like us to help publicize your classes, uh, let us know and we'd be glad to do that. Um, so there's there's all kinds of ideas about how you use a use a tool like this. And uh, you know, we have our ideas, but you'll have your ideas. So just go for it. 
and uh, let us know if you're doing something cool with this because we're very interested. If you're outside of California and you'd like to collaborate with these people in California, what would you do by the state have to then get a license for this product? Uh, well, that's a good question. So, uh, Illuminate itself, if you go to their uh, website, you can get a free limited license, which will allow you to experiment and play with the program and have uh, limited meetings. It's not going to meet the needs of a full class delivery. Um, all of these things you can license in various ways. Some of our partners in Hawaii have just gotten licenses for Illuminate in, in this way. Uh, uh, Bill in uh, Truckee Meadows has just gotten Adobe Connect license, so he's doing the same thing. So if you can articulate uh, the value proposition of use of this tool, you can convince people to make access to it. Any other questions? Anything else you would throw in, Rick? Or? The only thing I've mentioned is it does change how you deliver the cloud. You know, you always have a backup. Like, you know, you can look at the operating system, it's going to keep coming by. The wired mic can take that, you know, battery goes down. So, always have a little backup. It's not bad, just do it. We use it a lot to have uh, meetings with industry people because uh, it's too hard for me to drive to Sacramento every time I want to meet with somebody up there for them to drive down here. Here's a way we can get together, share documents, see each other, talk on the phone, it's all free. So how, um, can you go through that scenario or, and you want to talk to somebody and you want to set that up? They don't have to enroll as a student then, you can somehow just share your desktop? So, uh, oops. you, uh, I'm going to do a web tour to CCC Confirm. So, this is the interface. This is available to anyone in, in California. So, you click on Presenter, Faculty Login. And you put your uh, your login there, and you have to you know actually register with this the first time, and then you click on meeting request form. There's different kinds of meetings that you can schedule. You can have just a conference call; it's all telephone based. You can have online office hours, which is uh, phone and internet. You can have uh, meet and confer sessions. You can have webinars. Uh, so you can schedule any of these things. You uh, put your meeting date and time in there. You have to put uh, some sort of California Community College organization in here, a title, uh, and you. how many people do you want to have attend? You can have more than 50 attend. Um, and you, when you're done, you send this off and they'll send you back a meeting invitation that you can forward to your guests. It's free. It's that simple. Uh, there's an archive that's available here. Um, so anywhere here you can see uh, these are archives for, for meetings that have happened you know, in the last couple of days. We pretty much wiped them out today. So they're <laughs> The, the archives are not available yet. But you come to an archive, you uh, uh, you click on the, the link here. You can send people to that link. Anybody, anybody can access it from anywhere in the world, any computer, any browser, any network speed. So, would you have, I'm sorry. I was trying to follow up on the office hours. If you don't want your office hours, Archives or whatever, or you own Don't archive. record them. Oh, so they're not archived them. unless you record them. Okay. See right down here, this little button. The this shows that this session is being recorded. You never have to push record, and then there's no archive created. Thank you.
how much free notice does people see before meeting? Uh, not much. A few minutes. Uh, and they manage all that back end for you. So it's a, it's, it's a wonderful set of value added services. They provide technical support. People can dial an 800 number if they're having trouble getting on. So you don't have to take that call. Well, if you need somebody to uh, transcript, so I think we'll wrap it up. And uh, that's enough for today. And downstairs in the educated palette, there's uh, beer and wine and an opportunity to meet each other. I really encourage uh, everyone to do that because uh, one of the real great things that happens at these events is people connect with each other and uh, you'll share information and be able to call each other in the future with questions and problems. And, uh, really, I really would encourage that. And a little beer and wine helps with that. <laughs>